All right, guys, is this gonna be the last segment? I really hope so. I am ready for this to be the last segment. I am ready. Okay, let's rest first, then we'll give him the third fragment in case it jumps right into it. A third, yes, this is the last one. Prepare yourself, your highness. With the third fragment, the barriers around your castle will fall. The Lantern King will be waiting, ready to give you an audience. All right, let's do it. Let's finish this. Your footsteps echo from ce the ceiling of the ravaged throne room. The sound attracts the attention of old Remus slouched on the steps of the throne. He looks up, shakes his head slightly, as if displeased, but keeps silent. Nothing betrays the mask of a deity in this hunched man. Still hiding behind masks, eldest. Isn't it time you cast them away? Words, words. How little value we attach to them. How much they truly mean. But I've grown tired of words and prophecies. I will no longer predict chaos and death. Instead, I will show them to you myself. Oh, yes, the time has come! The time of fate and curses! Running won't help you! Oh. Okay. Me. That is terrible. Oh god, I only rolled a two. Oh, no wonder.
Stab them all. <laughs> Nowhere to run. I almost hit with some of those. Almost doesn't count, but. Maybe this will help? Tell me what they're casting, which is weird. This is going to hurt. There we go, one down. What does Bloodbird do? Uh. <coughs> oh. I mean, I could heal her. Rawr. Wait, that's the end.
Okay, these are all considered the Lantern King? Yes. Ah, good. You dead. Damn it. This is within There we go. I should have hit the one without the shield. That's bullshit. <laughs> Whoops. Fireballs. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. I feel like there isn't nearly enough fire, but hey. There we go. Nowhere to run. Yes. It's starting to break already. I've only been playing for four and a half hours and it's already starting to break. Like, what the fuck? memory leak or something that causes it. Because I don't think it's a coincidence that my performance is shit in this, like, mission. 
quest thingy. I'm gonna get people healed up a bit because I have a feeling that he's gonna reset again after. We got some good shots. Oh, come on! These guys out. Taste my beauty. The time for laughter has passed. It's the hour of hunting. So I'll have him pick out like the outskirts ones first.
Oh no, did he just die? I mean, we know he's not dead dead, so that's the important thing, but... Why, why, what? Why can't he die? Because I tanked the difficulty and nothing dies on the easiest difficulty. Like, literally nothing can die. They resurrect after the fight. The controls in this. Like, it's even worse with all of this lag because the mouse will move slightly and then that'll cause you to not click where you want to click. I'm going down to 8 frames per second. This is just dumb. And it's in turn-based, so it's not like there's 50 things moving on the screen. At, like, it's not like AI is taking up all the resources. There we go. Yeah, it keeps breaking, like, what the heck?
It's like, this isn't even an interesting boss fight. It's just, let's get you to fight every single thing you fought in the game so far. That's not interesting. That's just needlessly extending the gameplay. I don't know. That's how it feels, anyways. It's nice to use. What kind of noise was that? They go down. Like this would, I'd be less annoyed if this was running at more than 10 frames per second. Like sometimes I click and nothing happens. That's how low the frame rate is. There we go, okay. And it's broken again. No way. 
where to run. Yeah, it's going down as low as seven frames per second. Like, what the hell? Like, my game... And my... If anything, my GPU is getting cooler. Like, everything's getting cooler, which means that... It's just, like, not even trying. It's not making use of the resources that are available to it. The game's not making use of the resources that are available to it. Or it's trying to make reuse of the wrong resources. As the horn, as soon as the horn hunter's body disappears in the fire, the destroyed throne room is flooded with light. The lantern king, in its true blazing form, appears in the middle of the room. His furious mask is ringed by fire. The games have ended. Time freezes like resin, trapping you in the eldest in amber light, and as this light grows brighter, the rays pass through you, pierce you, ruthlessly barring your most intimate secrets, fears, and desires. Something inside of you resonates with the light of the eldest, your curse. It is like the splinter of an arrow that remains in the wound, a slow weapon crawling toward your heart. As soon as the rays touch it, it begins to heat up and then burns with intolerable pain. Time for masks is over. You risk challenging an eldest, and I accept the challenge. You will fight not a mere embodiment, but my true essence. This is my essence. I don't need magic or servile monsters to destroy you. Words are not. Yes, words. I once told you, words spoken in the right time and place possess the power of the storm. You lightheartedly answer that you know what your power and essence are. In jokes and lightness with which they are said. I remember your answer. The world remembers it too. Your answer, your heart, your essence. And now, cursed queen, I'm taking this part of your soul as I took away thy wrist's ability to love. What you called your essence is yours no more. Which is the better chance? That's a 15 difference. And that is a... same. Nope. <laughs> I failed. Uh, 
and blah, blah. This laughter, soft, insinuating, almost amiable, is scarier than any nightmare. It resonates with the hot metal splinter, the curse within your soul, making it stronger, slashing at your essence and taking away something essential that nourishes your power. Let us continue. We both wear a crown. But what do you want? I mean, your patch of land, a few thousand souls? My dominion is chaos and magic, madness and deceit. Your power is nothing but their demise. And that is why you are helpless before me. You will take my every blow as a divine punishment, as something imminent. Yes. There is great power in knowledge. It wraps you in an invisible veil and protects from the eldest blow. You feel his fury, but you know that it is not divine wrath, but the emotion of an ancient being. Mighty, but not almighty. I'm curious what you think of me, cursed queen. Do you see me as a villain, or a simple joker? In truth, well, everyone can see it, the truth. Being an eldest means being one of the many strings that hold the world in place. Being an eldest means being such a vast and self-sufficient value that one's equals become strangers and one's inferiors are entirely insignificant. I am an eldest. Back to the guile, transformation, that's what I am. Be what I am, I will let you feel a modicum of my loneliness. I will take away your pillar of strength. What, is there a rule by which those like you dictate and others will? Even if there is such a rule, I'll break it. I'll take back what's mine. The blinding light flashes away, frightened like a living creature. The blistering metal of the curse cools. It still hurts, but the pain is no longer unbearable. You stand before the eldest, before our, uh, blazing living star, and he looks at you as if he's seeing you for the first time. Good. You can play with words. Let us see if you can withstand the heat of my fire. Enjoy your final moments. Oh, everybody healed all the way up. Okay. is going to be immune to fire. No, not immune. Okay. Well, that's a surprise. Damn it, the frame rate is shit. No 
nowhere to run. No shit, I didn't mean to do that. the chance to see a star die. Spots of cold, lifeless darkness cover the fiery form of the Lantern King. Growing, devouring, and with a dull moan settling onto the ground in a cloud of cold, black dust. But a moment later, right where the eldest crown lay burning, another shining image is born. It grows, glowing, turning into a fam familiar silhouette, wearing a crown. I don't remember sensing it for millennia. In the end, all he wanted to do was die to get a new feeling. But what's next? How will you end this story? Listen, I know the man. Elegant and refined. The hero defeats a deity in battle. Impressed, he grants the victor power and immortality. The hero enters the chambers of the deity to become his champion and herald, eternal. Powerful, equally glorified both in the first world and in Valeria. Her kingdom healed from its wounds and flourished under the rule of the immortal champion. A beautiful ending, isn't it? And this legend is yours for the asking. Trust the laughing lie. Don't do this. Not after everything you and I have endured because of him. I can give you immortality and power, though not as much as the Lantern King's. Perhaps we won't be able to stand against the eldest, but accept my gift and my patronage. And together we will make him pay for what he's done. How sad it is to you that I miss him. Thousands of years for nothing! You haven't learned a single lesson. Never learned to atone. But what do you say? Mmm. Are you sure I can't kill you? I think I'll try. Did I tell you I don't like dying? <laughs> well, I don't. Perhaps we should stop this pointless exercise and speak seriously. Hmm. I will not bow to you. Don't get your hopes up. Here's my offer. Lift the curse, return my kingdom, uh, and forget we exist, and I will forget that you exist. After you speak, silence falls, deep as a chasm. Light pours from the eyes of the Lantern King's mask. Still, the mask of paternal care, though you do not mistake this for what lies uh, hidden behind it. So be it. This performance has run its course. It would be unwise to continue. Besides, I have no love of dying to turn into life. My fellow eldest are very good at playing especially intricate pranks at that exact moment. You were cursed by my will. By my will, you are now free from the curse. May the shackles be broken, fetters be loosened. What's been stolen will be returned. What's been divided will be made whole again. I say farewell, and release your kingdom to the material plane. So, be glad of your ordinary mortal life. Forget the gods of the first world. Now they no longer concern you. Now that the eldest and other spiteful beings wouldn't be bothering us, 
The queen returned to her subjects and celebrated the victory and the end of the kingdom's miseries with great fanfare. Everything gradually returned to normal, including our exciting lives. Not always peaceful, but also not troubled by invasions from another world. And little by little, our heroes and the common folk began to forget the sorrows of the past. Sometimes, on clear spring nights, the queen saw dreams. In them, the nymph Nyrissa, fierce and wounded, battled the Jabberwock, died, and returned to life again and again and again. Under the wise leadership of the Queen, the Stolen Lands became a true country. There was still much to be done, of course, and some of it will need to be finished by our heroine's descendants. But there are no longer cut purses on every corner, and the peasants aren't afraid some new self-proclaimed chief will show up and strong-arm himself into power. The Stolen Lands are called the Land of Popular Rule. For in these lands, common people feel fully in control of their fates. Unfortunately, the total absence of authority allowed one of the richest regions of the kingdom to proclaim itself an independent republic, and retrieving those territories came at a rather high price for the queen. Just half a year after the war with the First World, Galt moved its troops to the southern border of the kingdom. Their attack was rebuffed. The enemy state's infantry could do little against soldiers who were skilled with their swords and knew the military arts better than the alphabet. Since then, Galt hasn't risked crossing any borders again, fearing cruel retaliation for further insolence. The Queen's subjects praise her generosity, while citizens of neighboring lands groan from crippling taxes. Citizens of the Stolen Lands have it pretty good. Truth be told, the guys, we are finished. Capable of paying the royal bills, and the throne room's adornments are clearly decaying. But sometimes you have to buy the people's love, literally. The feud between Brevois North and South, which had been smoldering for ages, finally sparked the fires of civil war. We didn't interfere, watching as the forces of House Sertova and the Sword Lords slaughtered each other. Alternating between brief truces and fresh fights, Brevoy was flooded with blood and grew weak. Its leaders could only watch helplessly as their border territories were slowly annexed by neighbors, until they fell to squabbling among themselves. The butchery in Brevoy jeopardized the peace of the entire region. Led by careful, level-headed Dugath, the Tiger Lord's tribe reunited and started to lick the wounds left by the erratic Armok. Little by little, they once again became one of the strongest mercenary armies in the region. Dugaft always assured our queen of his friendship, but the queen always stayed on her toes, understanding that anything could happen when that old fox is around. Pitax never regained its former stature. In their fight for power, both bandits and the relatively honest merchants lost all their strength, scaring away both customers and suppliers. Trade routes began moving through other cities. Pitax fell into decline, and the citizens quickly forgot all of Irovetti's atrocities, remembering his rule instead as a golden age for the region. Governor Liacenza remembers what the Queen did for him, and serves her truthfully and loyally. There was no place for art in the new Pitax. Students and teachers from the academy were scattered to the wind. Some found a place in neighboring courts, while others set off to earn some coin in roadside taverns. A third group, harboring uh, the resentment toward the okay? queen, began weaving revolutionary plots. The ruins of the Academy of the Arts still stand in the middle of the city, overrun with ivy, empty and unwanted. The dangerous man-eating trolls disappeared entirely from the forests and swamps of the Stolen Lands. Kobolds, though, being sneaky and clever, are still sometimes met by travelers and hunters who wander off the beaten track. 
some even say the short reptile still prays the great King Tartuk, but no one knows for certain. As soon as anyone approaches the Kobolds, they forget their military honor and turn tail. Okay. During so many storms and troubles, Varnhold eventually turned into a real city. Daring settlers decided to conquer the vast, wild expanses of Dunsward, and despite all odds, they succeeded. The modest colony that almost like I can't tell if you just typed a sentence with your hands. Lich, turned everything around shifted, to become or a if you need some sleep. Lively river trading. Magar Varn didn't stay at the court for long. Having saved some seed money, he left service and organized a new Varnling host together with his general. And this new party of mercenaries has already helped our kingdom more than a few times. Agay, the Spriggan leader, learned a valuable lesson after surviving his meeting with the queen and even regaining his tribe's home. Don't try to occupy like even this is only running at like less than anymore. 30 frames per second. Instead, the Spriggan settled across Dunsward's wild borderlands and proclaimed it as their domain. Keeping the peace in a situation like that seems like the stuff of dreams, as evidenced by the occasional lost patrols and stolen cattle. Peace reigns in the caves beneath the old sycamore. The kobolds and mites continue to explore the depths and learn simple crafts from each other. Rumor has it, the first mite kobold wedding even happened not long ago. That said, settlers still aren't rushing to build new homes in the area. Some kind souls even put up warning signs along the roads. Beware, traveler. Steer clear of the old sycamore. Another inscription soon appeared over the sign, though. No keep going treasure ahead, honest. <laughs> Oleg's trading post continues to thrive, attracting even more travelers. Much to its owner's displeasure, a small town is springing up around it. Despite Oleg's grumbling, he and his wife are well regarded by everyone, and Svetlana was even elected town chief. Kestin Garas took a post as chief of the kingdom's guard. The former heir to a noble family never returned to Brevoy, severing all ties to his kin. However, a few years after the victory over the First World, a girl arrived from Brevoy and soon married Kestin. They say Kestin started smiling a lot more after that. Having participated in Lamashtu's ritual, Olika gave birth to a strong and healthy baby. Sadly, the child grew into an unruly and violent adolescent. Having maimed a peer at just ten years of age, the boy escaped to the Naro marches, fleeing the rage of a mob that tore his mother to pieces instead. No one knows what happened to the lad, but legends of Lamashtu's child, who sometimes kills lost travelers and sometimes leads them to safety, are passed on by word of mouth throughout the area. Reinhardt became a loyal ally and trade partner of the kingdom, and Darwin himself had been seen as a frequent guest in the capital. The elegant monarch of the neighboring kingdom has broken many hearts at court. After his visits, Many young guards and servants have been seen staring through windows, sighing wistfully about something. The lizard folk of the Longtail tribe returned to live on the shores of Candlemere, but they couldn't return to their ancient way of life. Living alongside people, the lizard folk adopted their behaviors, habits, and even religion. More and more of the Longtail tribe pray not to the spirits of their ancestors, but to Erastil or Gorum. They even began to forget their original language. I hope someone writes down their songs and legends before they all sink into oblivion. 
the How long is this? Departed on a journey, hoping to see as many wonders as possible of this world and others. They keep sending us news from every corner of the map. Their bright painted wagon, drawn by a bull mastodon, crisscrosses Galarian, somehow appearing in the center of one incredible story after another. Evindra was glad to see the Lantern King's plans turn to dust. She spent some time helping restore the kingdom after the Calamity, then returned home to the First World. They say the rebellious spirit of her cousin Nyrissa awoke within her as well. Evindra is said to recount our story to the Fae, encouraging them to question the power and might of the Eldest. After the victory, the storyteller abandoned his affairs and began spending a lot of time alone in contemplation. He eventually bid farewell to the queen and left her lands, but I suspect the inhabitants of Galarian haven't heard the last of this mysterious traveler, for his own story is hardly finished. At least I don't have to read this. Friends with Nylak. But she remained a pariah to all the other members of the Six Bears tribe. Despite all the wisdom of their new chief, the tribe never found its place among the unfamiliar plains and cities, and they soon broke apart. The two friends left the kingdom together, setting off to find their own adventures. Enough that it would take a separate book to tell them all. Valerie stayed to serve the queen, but not for long. She soon laid down her weapon to start her own family. Valerie married a simple farmer and bore him two beautiful children, then settled away from the capital, where she was soon forgotten. Harem became famous, respected by dwarves throughout our kingdom, as well as our neighbors. Hey, come on! <laughs> far as five kings' mountains. He's often been asked to help out or teach others, and he's never denied anyone, despite his grumbling. Some people even listen to his preaching. Lucky for us, there is a lot less howling about the end of the world now, and more wise words of moderation and humility. Not all of his disciples turned to Grotus, but everyone took away something useful from his teachings. Ekin spent a few years in the Stolen Lands, and in that time, won glory as the most rugged monster hunter in all the River Kingdoms. The ranger exterminated even the most harmless of the monsters around the capital, then moved on to other lands and new victories. They say the ruthless avenger and slayer of wild monsters made it as far as Katapesh. That's where his trail went cold. I'm afraid Ekin may have become the prey of one of his targets. Jubilost returned to the life of a traveling explorer frequently visiting his favorite kingdom. He said so himself. His famous work studying the First World all opened with a dedication to his longtime companion, the Queen. Sometimes, during Jubilost's performances, all kinds of chaos would break loose. Viewers turned into unicorns, or would be teleported to the top of a cliff. Later, Jubilost would be seen arguing fiercely with a pretty gnome named Nerv. The arguments looked very sweet and intimate. As for Knock Knock, apologies, I mean Jester Knock Knock, he continued to be a great source of entertainment for the kingdom, both in and out of the throne room, sometimes even on purpose. His antics in the kingdom had an additional effect. Aside from bringing joy and amusement to the citizens, it also softened the common view of goblins. They even became welcome in the streets of the city, for a time. While he may not have become the hero he envisioned, Knock Knock did find himself and his inner strength, thanks to the queen. If you should ever find yourself in the kingdom, yeah. be sure to seek him out. He'll gladly regale you with some new tale of adventure, one that will surely make you smile, whether our foolhardy, clumsy, well-intentioned goblin means to or not. Aww, that makes me happy. Kalika remained in the kingdom, though her desire to witness the world's wonders keeps driving her to take long journeys. But when she is home, she spends much of her spare time with her sister. They don't quarrel anymore, and have stopped dragging each other into trouble. 
Canera settled down in the capital and became a very busy entrepreneur. It seems as though every hour is planned, meeting with rich merchants or inventors whose work she's promoting. But on her way home, she never fails to stop at the market to personally buy some sweets for her sister. Between Canera's business sense and Kalika's charm, they founded and successfully run not one, but three organizations. A trading house, a shelter for tiefling children, and a school of magic devoted to Nethys. Ooh. Despite all the woes oh, that the country, our queen remains a strong leader. Many noble houses from neighboring lands wouldn't hesitate to be related to her, and they regularly send a variety of marriage proposals. As for myself, the author of this book, Lindsay, who never chose a pretty nickname. I'm still here, inside my creation within the Capitol Library. I live just like Oh, she's still queen, locked in the book. Surrounded by people and books. And not a day goes by without someone turning my pages. My story inspired many others to take up the quill. My readers have written many fierce books, articles, and pamphlets, flinging truth in the faces of tyrants. What more could I dream of? I hope, oh honored reader, that this story offered you some daring ideas. Or at least some entertainment. In any case, it's time to set the final period. Yay! Oh, man. All right, guys. I'm going to take a little bit of a break, and then I will probably be back with uh, some Horizon Zero Dawn uh, just because I want to get a replay of that in before re uh, the sequel is released. So hold tight, guys. I will hopefully be back. If I'm not, I'll be back tomorrow morning with some uh, Eternal Cylinder. Maybe do a, a half and half day. But until then, we'll see you guys all next time. Bye, everybody.